it's never getting better than this and we all know it. We set a new benchmark. Morgan Galen King and Philip Gillette. I like the idea of it being something that you've only heard about this weird thing because someone told you about it. <laughs> it's very unmagical magic. You know, it's got some people getting melted, there's some skeletons. Ultimately, it was worth it, I think. I hope. I think maybe we overshot. <laughs> Phil and I really went back and forth on what film to discuss. Ultimately, it had to be heavy metal, we decided. But self-aware of its own dumb teen horniness. This is just wild stuff. There's a Loch Nahr and there's this woman and she rides this dragon thing across the landscape and there's hook snorting aliens. It sets such a tone for everything. Generation defining animation and comic luminaries who's going to do things. I try to aspire to in everything I write. It casts such a long shadow. It has like a real whiplash in tone, especially if you don't know what you're in for. I have something to admit to you guys. I'm ready. I had not seen heavy metal. What? This episode is not for everybody. As I'm sure you noticed by that clip just there, uh, this one's a little bit different because the previous video episodes that I'd done, I'd recorded all of those in Annecy. Whereas this episode we recorded before that, actually. I didn't intend this originally to be a video podcast, but I'd recorded the video for some reason. But I really wanted to share this episode with you because it's so much fun. And it's something I think you'll find very, very useful, to be honest. And of course, like you can see from the clip in the introduction, this is going to be very different to what you're used to. On with the episode. This is fun. The last time we had two people on, they both chose different things. <laughs> we spent a long time doing this, but you guys chose the same thing, which is amazing and it's fun. So I've got Morgan Galen King with me and Philip Jitlat. How are you guys? Good, good. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. Excited, excited. You sound excited, <laughs> Phil. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't get your second name out of my mouth there for a second. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry <laughs> yeah. about it. Philip Gillard. How are you guys? What's going on? What's the story? Any scale? Where are you? <laughs> I, I think we're doing all right. You know, just sort of, it's finally getting spring-like up here. And I'm in uh, Nova Scotia in Canada at the moment. And it's, uh, it's finally getting warm, which is, it's been a long winter. So uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I would say on a scale of one to ten, I'm a, I'm 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 gonna call it a seven point five. I'm, I'm riding right maybe riding between high. seven and seven point five. We're doing you know we're doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's beyond okay. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> you know? That's fantastic. Um, and I'm in my bedroom. At the... <laughs> as many people I'm sure are as well. Um, yeah. So if you guys, if anybody here doesn't know much about Philip and and Morgan, like they. They, their work is so crazy. It's so much fun, especially Morgan's work. Um, they both recently co-directed and released The Spine of Night, which is a, a passion project that has been going on since 2013. And they released it last year, which is, I don't know how many years that is. Someone do a quick math. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Too many, <yeah. laughs> It's so much fun. Like It's a film that I don't think I would have watched uh, if I hadn't been told to watch it. No. <laughs> <laughs> guys. But I'm, I'm glad I did watch it because it's something that I think a lot of people could easily miss, but it's, I hope they don't because it's such a fun um, exploration of that kind of a period of time that seems to have been lost in the arts, you know what I mean? That a lot of people don't seem to be creating too much anymore. And um, you guys totally nailed it, but also made it feel so fresh and vibrant at the exact same time. Um and I think that's just a total testament to the kind of love and passion you guys put into the Spinal Night. So thank you for that. My pleasure. I, I hope that's how it happens. Like that it, it uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it with this film that we're going to discuss, but also, you know, I like the idea of it being something that you've only heard about this weird thing because someone told you about it. And then you're like, oh, well, we'll check that weird thing out. And you're like, this was better than I thought. It's, 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 it's kind of how like, I don't know, that's how cult films traveled when I was young, you know, before it was algorithmically determined what you were going to see. God, I never thought about the algorithm in terms of this. Yeah. Like back in the day of VHS tapes, you know, it's pulled down and like taping over someone's birthday party just to watch a film. You know? 
<laughs> yeah, those days are long behind us, but, you know, hopefully something like this. And, you know, obviously I think this bears a lot in what we're going to talk about. So we might as well just jump in and start talking about the film. So whoever wants to introduce the topic we've chosen today. Morgan, please. <laughs> well, after much debate, Phil and I really went back and forth on what film to discuss Be because we had like, there's a lot of influences, I think, on, on this particular film. And we also just, you know, we're fans of all sorts of obscure and cult animation. So it was interesting to, to pick one, but like, it almost felt like if we had to talk about a big influence that talking about the 1981 film, Heavy Metal is the, the, I don't know, it, it, it sets such a tone for everything, like even in a way more than Ralph Bakshi's films too, which I just, I love him deeply. Uh, I, heavy metal is just such, it, it casts such a long shadow. You almost can't talk about the sort of subgenres we're exploring without talking about either the movie or the magazine. Yeah. It, so it, it ultimately it had to be heavy metal. We decided there was just no, <laughs> like, <laughs> Many, many other uh, pretenders to the throne uh, arose, but at the end of the day, it would have felt incorrect to discuss anything other than heavy metal. So, <laughs> what were the other pretenders like? Give me, give me a bit of. Oh, so I, I uh, none of them. Well, like Akira was one that I, I just, I, it, and it's not. You can detect a, maybe a little bit of Akira in in Spine of Night, but again. It n n not nearly as the, the direct line of influence is not nearly there as much as heavy metal, obviously. And then I made a case for a movie that could not have inspired us because we both saw it after we saw, after we started Spider Night, which is um, Angel's Egg, right? That's what that movie's okay. called. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Which I, I just, I wanted to talk about because I just love it as a, just like a weirdo fantasy film that <laughs> that i just love so yeah. that was like quickly dismissed as like not really fitting the bill of what we were talking about um and then we obviously thought maybe about the bakshi films but not, none of those even fire and ice i don't think is really as a, a, a huge insp inspiration for spine of night as as heavy metal is so it really it, it just it just needed to be heavy metal i mean fire and ice is like i think the most the closest visual touchstone to what our, our film looks like, but I don't have a lot to say about it. It's, it's good, but it's, there's, it's such a simple story of, you know, good versus evil that it's like, it's, I, I could talk about it on like a very technical sense, like what they're doing with the animation that I thought was interesting, but that's not nearly as meaty of a podcast fodder as, <laughs> as a, as a big sprawling cult classic okay anthology film i have something to admit to you guys i had not seen heavy metal up until this year so, <laughs> what yeah that's amazing so hold on that just makes me think that this whole podcast should be about you talking about how you <laughs> responded to it having never seen it before like yeah. what did you what did you think <laughs> how, how it influenced my work from now on and <laughs> um, yeah it was it's so I, the only way I can describe it is like a monster with multiple limbs, you know, and each one is totally different and vibrantly wild. But I think something that's stuck in my head so much are those Tarna sequences. Like that is just breathtaking in the kind of scope and scale that they were trying to do within such a limited time frame. The the only problem with, uh, not with heavy metal, with me watching it now is because I'm so developed in a kind of a, um, a critical brain, you know, that I certainly didn't have as a teenager, yep. um, that I'm watching it critically from like an animation standpoint that I, I actually became aware that I was watching it critically. And I was just like, just stop, just enjoy this. You know, just, <laughs> just lean back and let, yeah, exactly. let it wash over you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that's what I really, really wanted. So once I kind of figured that out, and I think that was after the den, um, yeah, you know, uh, sequence, I don't know, what would you call them? Section sequences, stories? Yeah. Yes, yes. Sequence, sequence works for me. Yeah, sequence, yeah. 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 Sequences. Um, yeah. Like after that, I was just like, this is such a fun thrill ride. And you can see the DNA of of heavy metal, how it like exploded out then through animation through the like late 80s and 90s, especially a lot of Saturday morning stuff. You can really see its influence on things like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and even far reaching is, and I think this is probably more to do with 
uh, Mobius's work, but you can definitely see hints of it in like Nausicaa, like Miyazaki's Nausicaa and stuff. And mm-hmm. um, like the scope of this is so wild and far that it really like the influences are so deep, you know? Um, yeah. And I've realized I haven't talked about my experience. <laughs> I just tell you that <laughs> the influences. But please tell me your experiences. <laughs> well, similarly to what we were saying um, earlier about bootlegs, I mean, I first saw it mm. uh, at a sleepover at Alan Brainerd's house. <laughs> <laughs> what was the address, Morgan? Yeah, he's, he's here tonight. We have him. He's here yeah. tonight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I haven't spoken to him in probably 30 years, but I, I know where he works. Um, <laughs> now he, uh, I doesn't even remember that. But to me, it was like one of those formative evenings where his, his older sister's older boyfriend brought a bootleg that had, because it was in that window of time and heavy metal was out of, print like you couldn't it was so you could only see it as a bootleg for soundtrack licensing issues um and so it was it opened with the bambi versus godzilla short then went into <laughs> heavy metal and then creep show 2 and well, my guess is it was that 19, is a killer tape killer it was, tape <laughs> it blew my mind i think it was like 91 only because i was just looking it up and that was the year it uh they showed it on hbo and some people must have been able to tape it. Anyway, so it was a it was an amazing night. They they pair together really well. Um, I've always I mean Creepshow one's obviously I think the better film, but Creepshow two is the one I saw first, and so I love it more. <laughs> um, but it was just an incredible night of having my mind totally blown by mm. things that I'd never you know I was I guess twelve at the time. Yeah, maybe eleven. And it was the, just, it, it electrified my brain as to what animation could be. And then just anthology storytelling, you know, I, I'd never really seen it done that way, much less two films back to back. So, um, yeah, that, that was my first exposure to it. And I, I kind of never stopped thinking about it. So <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was defined <laughs> by that one night. And funny enough, you know, you guys on the podcast can't, see morgan but directly behind him is a giant poster that says heavy metal and then and even more hidden is his own film's poster <laughs> so you can tell what he cares so much about here yeah. i'm a simple man <laughs> very simple yeah what about you phil i think you talked about your dad or or is someone going yeah so you? so uh, i wish that i had as specific like like yeah. Morgan's Batman origin story where like one yeah. night he, he walked into a movie theater and came out changed. Uh, so I, I don't remember really the first time I saw it. I think I was aware of the magazine um, mm. from going to like, like remember when comic shops were like distributable places where you would go and like see things you weren't supposed to see. So I, I'm pretty sure that at the uh, this place called Next Shishans, which was the local comic book store in my small town in the Midwest, um, had heavy metals. So I remember like the, the logo meant something to me. And then I think my dad, when it was finally released on VHS, which I think was 1996, I think, um, he brought it home. He like bought it at Best Buy or something. I I am sure he purchased it specifically because he was like, oh, my son likes heavy metal music. This is a VHS that says heavy metal on it. He would probably like it. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I did not obviously have as singular experience as Morgan did, but I, I vividly remember watching it and just being like, yeah, I mean, it's just a really bizarre and unique thing. And even at that point, I think already the, the, the brand heavy metal to me because of the comic book experience and because of them watching the movie meant like, uh, you know, genre that was like, like imaginative and wild, but then also like, adult quote unquote like you know there there were boobs and there was blood which was not something that you were going to see in any other kind of animation uh i think i probably even saw it speaking of movies we almost talked about i think i actually probably had seen akira before heavy metal um but but you know again those two combined i think were really formative you know because it's an anthology they can you know have fun with the storytelling in so many different ways and i know that i I, listening to interviews with Ivan Reitman and, and some of the writers, like 
the way they talk about stitching it together, they invented the the Lochnar, isn't that mm-hmm. idea? Um, just as a kind of a wacky, wild, just just something to glue everything together. But it, it just had this kind of great energy about it. I don't know how they just stumbled across this kind of mad idea of a ball of pure evil that just, <laughs> just like, let's just slap it in the story wherever we need to do. But it, even the name of it and everything, it just kind of evokes these... Like it's something that I, I really found that stuck out from Spine of Night is what you named the characters that had that feel like it had that kind of great, almost alien, but not at all. <laughs> you know, right. Yeah. Of, yeah. 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 I felt that, you know, Egyptian, but not quite kind of names <laughs> these people had. It, like how, how then has that stuck with you? Like how have you found it come back into your life, uh, heavy metal throughout your work? Well, I mean, we rewatched it uh, just yesterday so that we'd have it fresh in our minds for discussion. Yeah, I, I have copious notes. I don't know how hard, <laughs> how far we want to go into this, but the um, deeper. But it, every time I see it, I am like, oh, that's also in the spine of night. Like, not <laughs> even not like totally subconscious yeah. references, but there's like a a part at the end where the I can't even remember his name, the the mutant leader in the Tarna section. You know, he's going to, you know, he asks for his whip and it's like the same kind of like flogging whip Mm, that we had our, uh, you know, Patton Oswalt voiced villain use in the spine of night. And I was like, oh, I didn't even parse that that was in my brain. He even says in a similar phrase, I think in heavy metal, he says, clean her and bring her to me. And I was like, oh, that's just the mongrel line with slightly different yep. line. He says, bind her, bring her with us in, in Spider Man. I was like, oh, that's the, that's the same line. It's just yeah. slightly, slightly said in the same way even. Um, and in that same sequence, they, you know, like the, his soldiers all have like these um, like nail guns almost or like needle firing guns. And I was conscious of making a reference to that when we had those sort of like a crossbow version of that in at the finale of the Spine of Night. But I was um, when we were we were scanning some old um, sketches to maybe put together, you know, like share them online when, for mm-hmm. the release. And I found some old uh, comic books I had drawn in like middle school, and. I had clearly ripped those off there too. Like I, I didn't remember even making this thing, but my, I think my mom had packed up my old room and mailed it to me at some point. So I had yeah. these old comic books I'd drawn. So like clearly like certain images from that just are way, way in my head. And I, I mean, and on throughout the film, like the, the part in Tarno where they go to like, they're like, we have to go to the council room and the council is all having this meeting about what they're yeah. going to do about the problem. I mean, I think we do that maybe three times in this fight of night. So like it, it's all out there. It's, it's theme, and, theme and variation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, from my perspective, I like, I almost view it. I mean, there's certainly like the one, the one-to-one, let's just call them homage. It is not rip offs <laughs> in this fight of night. But I, but I sort of view heavy metal, both the magazine and the the movie as this, like benchmark of as I, I think i said it before too of like really like genre storytelling with the breaks off in a way that is something i think I, I sort of aspire to i try to aspire to in everything i write even if i'm being hired to write something really boring and sort of not politically conservative but let's say creatively conservative um and it, it's like it, it it's the same to me as like, if you go back and I don't know, like read H.P. Lovecraft or like early pulp fiction where these people are telling stories really with no, like, because they love it. And because, and with, and with really no view, I think to like a broader commerciality, like they're just like, yeah. this is just wild stuff. We're going to, there's a Loch Nahr and there's this woman and she rides this dragon thing across the landscape and there's Coke snorting aliens. And it's just like, it, it's, <laughs> It's sort of like when you look at um, there's something coming to mind that's on my shelf right there, like Jack Kirby's um, New God stuff, where it's just like he's just creating and cre- like just 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 throwing it all at the wall and doing doing everything in a really an imaginative way, uh, which I just love. Like that that to me is what genre and like fantasy and sci-fi should be. It should be like it should be 
throwing you out of this world as far as possible. And I, and I think heavy metal in the, in the best of times is that's what it does. I think it's funny that you talk about that, like just throwing things at the wall and see what paint trips down together, you know? Um, because I know that it really feels like they've got a very kind of comic attitude in writing this film. Like they, they don't, it, it, I know in interviews and stuff, they said they didn't really make it for the, you know, the stoner generation to go and watch. They were just having fun, right. just slapping these kind of stories together and just like, how creative can we push this? How, and they, and they're very like, oh, we might've gone a bit far there, but you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It, but that's what you need when it's just pure escapism. It's just, it's absolutely like um it's just wish fulfillment all over that's all these kind of things are the thing that struck me on this rewatch that i had sort of forgotten and and i don't think really is an influence on spider man because i think spider man is actually like tonally consistent is the way that that heavy metal and this sort of relates to what you were just saying like it it has like a real whiplash in tone like even if you look at like the end of the den sequence which is then up until this point is sort of you know it's like a action adventure story but then at the end when the two villains start arguing over the Loch Nahr, it becomes he's he, he's like it's my Loch Nahr. and she's like no it's mine it becomes broadly comedic on, on the ter- like the drop of a dime it's really um and that feels it related to what you're saying it not not improvisational necessarily but but akin to it where they were just like oh we'll just just it almost feels like the two voice actors were improving in the studio and then they're like oh just make it make it silly now um which is really it, it's, I think, a little bit jarring because I, I, I think a lot of, you know, movie making now is is all about tonal consistency, but it also makes it fun because it's just like, like what, are you, what are you doing? Like, like why, why is this this way? It's, it's uh, I love it. Yeah. I think you can really see what I had is surely improvisational at the end of um, the coke snorting alien segment. Uh, so beautiful, so dangerous. <laughs> the where it's like the the robot and the lady are just like walking around and discussing what their relationship mm. would be like, and the, yeah. the animation is clearly just something that they threw in to match the right. dialogue. Right? You know, it's not driven. You know, it's it's clearly trying to fill this time to get the jokes in. So, you know, and, and, you know, Bakshi did that quite a bit, like a lot of his, not really in Fire and Ice and Lord of the Rings, but his other films have quite a bit of improvisation. Even in Fritz the Cat, like literally just put a microphone in front of a table of people and just, it's just like yeah. talk, you know, um, which is interesting because I know that obviously a lot of the talent was attracted on board because Ivan Reitman was involved, you know, and, um, they were also, I think at the same time they were making, he was making stripes and they would literally, that's how they got John Candy is they'd walk him from one set into the other one and just say these lines and then send them back to the set. So it's just like, it feels very chaotic, even in, in the construction, like the creation of this. And then you've got, because in the film, I don't know if we explained this at the start, but it basically, <laughs> it's basically, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's a lot of different sequences stitched together and each sequence is like animated by a totally different team of people, uh, you know, and they have a supervising animator and these are like some big names in the industry, like, you know, Jimmy Murakami and, you know, people like John Hallis, even someone like Jack um, Stokes. And they just were doing their own thing and there was an overall director who was just kind of supervising everything, Gerald Potterton. Um, But a lot of it, it seems very kind of writer driven more than animation kind of driven. You know what I mean? It's, I mean, it no seem board driven. disrespect to anyone who worked on it, but I, I just yeah. kind of think of it more as Dan O'Bannon's movie than yeah. anyone else's. Like yeah. he, he directly wrote two of them, but he also wrote the story, the comic that the Harry Canyon segment is is based on so i mean that puts him at like writing half of the stories that's very true and he and you can see that totally across it because if like you were saying phil if there is a like there is tonal whiplash but when the tone returns it seems to be from his yeah. from his yeah. stories you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah we just we land back in the soft dan O'Bannon cushion that, yeah. that, that, <laughs> just like ah okay because <laughs> when i first watched it i was just like oh right where is this going like how how, how are they going to stick this landing you know and then the tarnas sequence i was like oh okay i see i see what's going on here <laughs>
<laughs> because some of them are just wild. Like, and I know some. Like, there was a sequence cut as well, wasn't there? Yeah. Yes, there was. What, what yeah. I think might have been the coolest sequence had it actually been completed, um, and actually, I think was an inspiration to Spine of Night because it, it's a it's a world creation sequence, um, right? Like that that hand, the burning hand from the stern sequence was supposed to like generate a world, right? Morgan, is that correct? The Lochnar drops out of his hand and walk and crashes into Earth and you sort of see it like the history of Earth, like it evolves and you know, like there's dinosaurs and then it's, you know, I think Jack the Ripper and then it goes into, you know, it's, it, it's uh, I think it ends and then it ends with uh, like Hitler coming to power and then cuts to B-17, which is where so you pick it up at World War II with the, the the bomber airplane sequence. Which was great as well, actually. That was, I found so, um, that really captured my attention, like, because they just yeah. cut out the music suddenly. And he's like creeping down the plane. And I was like, it'd be cool if these guys came back to life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, certainly n no question that my love of animated skeletons uh, is, is connected to that. <laughs> to that sequence, yeah. I just want to throw this out there because mm -hmm. I feel like this is something that I've been thinking about for like 20 years about okay. that sequence. Mm -hmm. I'm so ready. If you'll, if you'll, <laughs> I've probably said this to you before, Phil. I'm not ready. But, but all right, so Dan O'Bannon wrote yeah. B-17. He previously had written Alien. Right. Okay. So anyone who's done some research into the alien origins knows that the original draft for alien was what well, was star beast, but before it was that it was called gremlins. And it, and, and I have the quote here cause I brought it up just cause I wanted to talk about it from Dan O'Bannon. He says, um, I had another script idea I told about called Gremlins, about supernatural creatures on a B-17 bomber. The setting of this other story was World War II in the Pacific Theater. Our boys, having firebombed Tokyo, turned back towards their island base, at which moment lightning strikes the tail of the plane, bringing the deadly little creatures on board. The Gremlins of World War II lore and legend. They invade the tail gunner's turret, kill him, and begin to work their way forward through the plane. And so... I mean, I just think I have not seen this discussed. Maybe it's somewhere and I just haven't read it, but it seems like this is the leftovers from when they turned the gremlin script into alien is what ended up, they ended up reusing for heavy metal, which I just always thought was interesting. Yeah. That's your discussion, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't it is interesting. I don't, I, I mean, I, uh, I, I've not read, I love Dan O'Bannon generally, but I haven't, I haven't read that whole interview, so I should probably read it at some point. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't even really think that we would end up talking about Dan O'Bannon, but I, uh, uh, yeah, he's like Definitely. one of my absolute favorites because all of his stuff is so, I mean, it, it's exactly what we're saying about heavy metal. Like it, it, it's uh, just wild, crazy, fun genre stuff. Um, was for sure his brand. I, I think you're right because I've seen some of the concept, or, or was it concept work, or I've seen some of the artwork of the gremlins attacking the mm -hmm. um, the soldiers. Sorry, that, that took a while to find that word in there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know what they are. I I really like that that sequence because again, it, it, like we talk about kind of tonal whiplash all the way through, because that felt so serious. You know, it felt yeah. so. Um, <clears throat> deep you know i think it's probably the only you talk about the music cutting out i would next time i watch it i want to go back and really just look at it might be the only time that the, that movie is pretty wall-to-wall -wall music either with the bernstein score or the the you know heavy metal heavy metal part of it <laughs> um but except for that sequence i definitely noted the silence there too where i was like oh this is really cool that suddenly we're we're just in the like sound design tonality here um Anyway, I should, yeah. next time I'm going to go back and really note that stuff. I think it's interesting, too, that that's not the Bernie Wrightson chapter or sequence right, yeah. in the film. Like, his is stern. Every time mm. I'm watching it, I like in my, I just, because he does so many creepy skeleton men and yeah. just, like, goo in general that it's, uh, yeah. I, I always I forget it, that that's not his. Is it Mike Plug who designed the those like, skeletons, I think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wait, so Cole, I have to ask you, what yeah. was your favorite sequence as a, as a, was it Tarna? Tarna. Yeah. yeah, of course. A hundred percent. Because when, when I saw, I know there's a lot of ropes, rotoscoping involved in that. Um, I think actually it's probably between Tarna and, um, Harry Canyon. 
I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the kind of Mobius design yeah. elements of that that are just so... Um, what's the word? Not otherworldly, but kind of. Do you know that? Yeah. What he was so good at. There's something I, I've been looking for for a long time, which is like epicness in animated films, which is very, very hard to find. They just don't really do it. There's only a handful of films that I can really think of in terms of like what defines epicness for me. And, and one big word for me is scale, you know, the scale right. of movies. Maybe The Prince of Egypt is something like that. The scale of that is absolutely massive in, in terms of kind of epicness. But when I started seeing the Tarna sequence and, you know, the kind of following through flying through the landscape i was like oh my god this is massive and then they switched to the kind of multi-plane and she's like a little speck on the screen mm -hmm. and i was like god damn it <laughs> this <laughs> is so good it's so entrancing and the fact that again this is storytelling where she's totally mute like she doesn't need to say anything you're just so entranced by the visual elements of it um you know, the most jarring then for me was the coke snorting aliens. <laughs> it's just like, what the hell? Generally speaking, whenever I speak ill of heavy metal, that's my my go to <laughs> punching bag is, is that sequence. <laughs> but I will say, I said this to Morgan yesterday on this rewatch, I didn't mind it as much as I have on pre. I don't know if I was just like, I've not watched the movie in maybe, I don't know, six years or something. It's been a little while. So maybe I was just in the right place to, to, to appreciate it on its own <laughs> merits or something. But I'm still <laughs> like, this is this isn't so bad maybe i shouldn't be ripping on it as much as i do i do think it could use a better conclusion like it, it's the one that doesn't really land like they just crash right like there's no well, they do it does land you know quote I mean, right. yes it does it, it does land but you yeah. know what i mean um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they crash and then they discuss the whether or not they could figure out how to do a jewish space with <laughs> Improvisationally, <laughs> seemingly, and at the end. <laughs> You're right. It's that. It's the true masterpiece of the film, actually. Yes. <laughs> I think about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what my favorite is. I, I really do love Harry Canyon. I have one very specific note on Harry Canyon, which I feel like they are missing a beat of suspense when she draws the gun on him and then he obliterates her with the thing. It all happens so fast that the, like the there's no. Like there, at no moment do I feel any suspense in that scene at all. It's literally yeah. like, I think it's, you know, a problem in the editing or in the animatic process. Who knows? But anyway, I always find the ending, like I can see that it should be more satisfying than it is, but it isn't because the it, the timing is just, I think, in, incorrect. But up yeah. until that moment, it's, it's I think it's really great. Um, uh, I mean, I really love all of them, but I mean, I think I would agree that I think Tarna and B-17 are the highlights. Um but I, I also, I mean, I, I always love Harry. I, I love Den. I, mean, I think Den is a Den, lot. Of, yeah. I think, it's, I think <laughs> John Candy's performance is really funny. Yeah. You know, I even having seen the gag, you know, forty times in my life, when he's like, when the the lady has her top off and is swirling her hair, and John Candy goes, just like she had beautiful eyes. <laughs> it's just such a great <laughs> delivery. When you like, it's. Like he's, it's his internal monologue, like lying to himself. I don't know. I, I, I think his performance is funny. In that. It, it also has an ending that I think is an ending you don't often see. Like, like if you think about Den as sort of a traditional fantasy story where it's like somebody from earth is drawn into another land, but then inevitably at the end of the story, they have to return to earth. Mm -hmm. I love it. that At the end of Den, he's like, fuck earth like yeah. i like i i much prefer it here <laughs> yeah, which yeah. is like yeah of course you do because you know like who wouldn't want to stay in a fantasy world as like a buff hero dude you know um yeah <laughs> It's an ending that I've, you're right, you don't usually see. And it's funny because it just popped into my head. And it's not that I'm the biggest fan of these films, but I remember when I saw Venom and he's just like, I'm a total loser on my planet. I want to stay here. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate yeah, exactly. that. Yeah. And I can see the the kind of power draw that uh, then I'd be like, yeah, why would I go back? It's like, so you can wake up from your dream of being the king of the universe or, and go back to, you know, studying for your exams, or you can, you know, be the king of the universe for the rest of your life. It's just like, well, I know what I'm choosing here. Yeah, yeah take that, Campbell. Sort of, in that sense, like, I think, I mean, not probably not by design, but you could make the argument that it sort of subverts the standard, like, the hero's journey trope, right? Which is that totally. you, you go to some place, you learn a lesson, then you come home and you've, yeah. you've grown up on the way. But this one's just like, nah, we're just, we're just going to stay on that adventure. We're never going back. It's great. I love I mean, it. it's, it's kind of the mission statement for the whole project, really. You yeah. know, like it, 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 it's like we're, it persists in the 
like the the juvenile fantasy for as as it's never getting better than this and we all know it and i, I don't know i like that <laughs> yeah. I, I think den works really well is because it's also the most almost shot for shot adaptation of one of the comics from mm. from the original publication like den's super close except for mm. you know the inclusion of the Lochnar. but like it's it's you can even I like you can tell there's two animation teams working on that one mm -hmm. because one of them resolutely sticks to doing Corbin's really detailed like colored shadows and just shot to shot like you lose they have it and they lose it 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 looks incredibly difficult to animate to mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. so I can see why <laughs> what yeah. it got cut at some point they're like well we're yeah. not doing that for this whole sequence I mean you don't be but, drawing those muscles so often like I mean you yeah. gotta that's why obviously with Spider Knight like choose the detail you want to retain because otherwise it's going to elongate it all um yeah totally and and that's what I like about Dan as well because it's something that you know <clears throat> It's obviously a, a, you know, would this film be made today? Totally, absolutely not. You know, <laughs> there's not a hope that zero percent chance. Yeah, male power <laughs> fantasy is not going to be, you know, made at all today. But it's something that kind of Dan, I think, really not really addresses, but has a lot of fun with, is the idea of like, you know, let's give a man a perfect body with a giant penis, and everyone, <laughs> you know, falls yeah. in love yep. with him. You know, they kind of slightly twisted what they were doing to every woman in the film <laughs> so yeah, far yeah, there, you know? yeah and that's it, how i, I watched the uh, rough cut after we watched the regular version just because wow. i i never sat down and watched it but they on the blu-ray at least they have the the full you know like very very oh, rough I, i've not watched it either i should i should watch it once the animatics are really locked into place they don't deviate much but mm. the one biggest sequence outside of the entirely missing sequence that they cut is uh Dan talking to the woman for like another 35 40 seconds just about how improved his body is and like marveling <laughs> at his his own muscles it's it, it was yeah. you know but fully they actually animated it it's not even wow. it, it wasn't even you know you, you, it's funny too you yeah. can tell what the animation priority was in that any scene with naked people was fully animated by the time they put this animatic together and all the hard stuff they're like well we'll get to that later yeah, yeah. we don't need to turn this character in space so we'll just have a flat image of it exactly. yeah. Yeah. but make sure that tarna sequence of the woman rotoscoped is totally done you know? yeah. as we turn her perfectly in space putting on a glove yeah. and stuff. take as much time as you need with that Part. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, we, what about this beautiful uh, thing where it's like a world being created? No, cut that. Cut that. <laughs> yeah, get rid of it. Yeah, we need more women. Yeah. It, it is borderline unanimatable, though. When you see what they were doing, like in, like it's obviously amazing, but like the level of like fidelity that they were trying to capture with that, in, even in animatic form, is a tremendous. But I mean, it would be almost an in comprehensible amount of work to pull it off what they were trying to do especially in the time frame they gave them i think they only gave them like a year to make this or, or slightly longer which right. is insane you know yeah it's totally insane yeah i feel bad for the guys because they're like yeah we were working on it like 14 15 hours a day uh, but we made it and you're just like jesus sorry guys sorry sorry you went through that for our giddy pleasure you know but it will it will echo forward through the culture right so it's ultimately it was worth it i think i hope for their yeah, sakes <laughs> i hope so too yeah i mean they're all legends now you know to yeah, men at least what what i liked about it is i know you said that it took forever for it to kind of to circle around due to music rights to be home released so like it was totally bootlegged and circulated but then when it was home released they decided to re-release it in cinema again you know, which I'd say was a wild thing to experience again for any, you know, teenager who'd seen it who might have kids at that stage, because this is a good 16 years later, nearly, you know, um, to bring them along <laughs> to something. Well, you probably wouldn't bring your kids. Uh, yeah, no, that's a terrible I mean, point. Dep depends on the parent, I suppose. <laughs> that's true, uh, yeah. It's really, I mean, that, it, that that's one of the really cool things about the movie and just about cult stuff. In general, like I, I love that heavy metal disappeared for that amount of time. I mean, it, it sucks for the filmmakers, but it, it I think it gave it that kind of cultural cachet that is harder and harder. Well, I don't know if it's harder and harder in the 21st century because of the internet, but but it is. 
don't know. It's just the thing. Like if, if you, I know for me, if there's something that exists and I'm told that I can't see it, it, it acquires this ultra cachet of like, well, now it's the only thing yeah. that I can think about and I have to see it, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's, uh, and I think that gives it a lot of its power. Yeah. Yeah. The fear of loss. Like, no, yes. I need to, I need to, I need to see yeah. it. Or also like, like, being told that I can't do something just makes me want to do it. Right. So, so it's, it's a, you know, it's a personality flaw, I suppose. Yeah, it's gone you this far. Yeah, it's true. You know, uh, so are you guys going to delete spine of night then? And, and mm-hmm. see what yes, happens. exactly. We're going to, we're going to disappear it for until 2038. And then suddenly it's going to, it's going it's to reemerge. <laughs> <laughs> like how precise that is it just totally model it's uh, you know. <laughs> just release it in cinemas on uh, you know did you guys re- you released it you had a limited release in cinemas, did. didn't you? Yep. did you guys yep. go see it in the cinema i did not <laughs> no it didn't I, it didn't screen we i set up a screening here in town so that i could go see it but it was it, it wasn't at a like part of our re- larger release plan mm. uh but we did we saw it in the theater at uh telluride at the festival, oh, yeah, the festival. yeah that's true ah, okay yeah. okay yeah so you did ultimately yeah it just you it, was, it was pretty awesome the guy next to us though fell asleep but then he woke up walked around and, ca- and came back so he he must have just had a wild night the night before i don't i don't know <laughs> at least he came back yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. and it was wake himself up a little bit. this is a conversation has become very whiplash total, total yeah we're it, it, every everything in life should be more like heavy metal just, just be you go where you want to go if it's tonal whiplash it's tonal whiplash no, yeah, no exactly. problem yeah <laughs> what are notes have you got there morgan i'm curious to... yeah oh man well i went, I went through every single section and i talked a lot <laughs> i'm good let's see <laughs> i have a lot of notes about the soundtrack Oh yeah. I, this is, I think, probably our our hottest take about okay. this film. Wow. Yeah. Is that it's famous for its soundtrack, and its soundtrack was why it was out of print for so long. And I think it is not good. Like <laughs> it's it's not good. Like it's a lot of like if if you just look at the list of bands, I like most of these bands. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone is a big fan of Riggs. No offense to, to the, me- the members of Riggs. <laughs> They're but, actually here tonight as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but like, I don't even think their, their song's one of the better ones, even they're one of them. But like, it's a lot of bands who have had like big membership changes. They're past their prime, sort of like, and they, they're like transitioning into like very middle of the road, you know, uh, fair like it's definitely careers at low points uh for a lot of classic bands who made some of them came back later but like it's it is not uh, hardly anyone working at full power i mean maybe the blue oyster cult i was gonna i I was gonna say i would argue that veteran of a thousand psychic wars or whatever that song is is if not the greatest blue oyster cult song um, among the greatest blue oyster cult songs okay yeah 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 and i would also say I will stand in defense of maybe three or four songs on that soundtrack. So that one, Mob Rules, I think is is a pretty good Ronnie James Dio Black Sabbath song. It's it's all right, but it's not deployed very well in the film. I don't think mm. they kind of just throw it in there when some people are running past the screen and fade it yes. out in the middle How, of a line. <laughs> but you know what is deployed well is the uh, the like weird synth Black Sabbath track that leads into it. The like That's whatever true. it is, E one five O is I think deployed pretty well. Uh, one of the Devo songs sucks, but I think Through Being Cool is a good Devo song. Uh, and I yeah. like the version of Devo that's in the movie. Um, yeah, yeah, love it. But like the, the the Devo song in particular, the closing the film, so you get this majesty of Tarna, right? <laughs> and then, then the weird bookend where they try to make the framing device fit in with Tarna, and you're like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And she flies off. So that they, you've had a lot of like epic momentum throughout this film. Then they throw in the most tacked on, may the spirit of Tarna carry on through all of us. <laughs> and then cut to this Devo cover, wonky, dumb cover of working in a coal mine, like a, a, like a so, traditional song. It's just like you walk out of the film, just like, oh, come on. Like, this was so good. I so- have a lot of questions about that song and what it's doing there because it's not even like it almost feels to me like contractually they had to use two devo songs mm-hmm. because 
they also don't even play the whole song over the credits. So like they, the song, they play like two minutes of it and then transition back into the Bernstein soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I don't even know why they didn't just flip it. Like if you would have ended with the Bernstein soundtrack and then brought in, if you had to working in a coal mine (laughs) midway through the credits, it wouldn't do nearly as much damage to the the landing of the film. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially, especially because like the score is phenomenal. Like it's yes. really, really beautiful. Yeah. Like it, that underscores the film incredibly well. It does. And to the point about tonal whiplash, I think that like Bernstein is doing like a lot of heavy lifting to smooth over some of those, <laughs> some of those <laughs> tonal uh, transitions. Like I, I, I was thinking about this in regards to the opening, mm-hmm. maybe five to 10 minutes of the movie, which does some like bananas tonal shifts it like opens with mysterious space transitions into like rock and roll astronaut (laughs) and then transitions into like family story and then and then goes into like (laughs) melt the dad yeah yeah like melt like body horror and like cosmic (laughs) like cosmic body horror in the course of like again maybe maximum five minutes i think uh (laughs) but i think a lot of that is the the reason that it goes out i mean it is Maybe it doesn't go over great for everybody, but the reason it goes over at all, I think, is because of the the score that's mm. that's sort of <laughs> doing its best to make this all make a kind of an emotional sense, even though it, objectively speaking, does not make any emotional sense <laughs> at all. You know, uh, I, I do think it sets up the rest of the film as sort of like it's going to be like sort of a kaleidoscope of styles and tones and so on. I'm sorry to, to be clear. I love it. And I, what I love about it is that it like, it should not work at all, but I actually do think <laughs> I actually do think it works, but just when you like abstract it to its, to its composite parts, like, I, as you said about Den, like nobody would make a movie this way today. Like, and I mean, Den for different reasons, but this opening is like, you would be like, what, what, what is this movie? Is it a comedy? Is it a horror movie? Is it a science fiction movie? Like yeah. what, what are turns, you doing? It turns out yeah. it's all of these things. Turns out it's everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's everything. Turns out it can be everything to everybody. You know, it didn't jar me when I watched it because I, I was just expecting bonkers, <laughs> yeah. you know? So I was just like, all right, okay. He's melting now. Fair I enough. Mean, I, I love that. He's like here, daughter i brought this for you and then like had he not looked at it before like like why like like wait it's so weird that he's like uh and then yeah. just melts i love it it's so it's so weird the 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 issue just on that subject of the mm-hmm. the gore and the melting upon watching it this time you know after you know finishing our film which uh, you know is pretty gory i had uh I think my mind's eye had exaggerated how violent this film was. Cause it's, you know, it's got some people getting melted. There's some skeletons. I think when the eunuch gets shot with the nail gun in Tarna, yeah. it's really yep. gnarly. But uh, I, even like when Harry Canyon's melting people in his back seat, it's kind of tame. It's, it was more tame than I remembered it being. And when we were, I think, trying to evoke its uh, gore in the spine of night. I don't know. I think maybe we overshot <laughs> if, we, if this is what we were going for. I was surprised at how not as gross it, it was as it, I envision it when I think about it on an animation level. They kind of built them pretty fast. They do. As opposed to, you know, Spine of Night when the bird people are getting melted, <laughs> you know, yeah. just like horrific, really yeah. horrific, but in a great way. I totally agree with what you're saying, Morgan. I think you, I think you might have overshot the homage to Gore there. Yeah. yeah, we just, we set a new benchmark. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, it, you know, the Harry Kenny, the first guy who melts in the backseat is pretty gnarly like you know and then for the woman they just kind of make her naked and disappear <laughs> of, <laughs> of course, course. <laughs> of course. Like, we can definitely get one more <laughs> nude shot in here <laughs> any opportunity yeah. i think it, it is so interesting like how they chose the stories that they did like as to i know they had to go and try and get rights and stuff and blah, blah, that probably you know influenced it but the sheer variety of storytelling in this is just insanely ambitious you know really really ambitious too and again we like it seems to be that <laughs> the message of this podcast is tonal uh whiplash but it just <laughs> tonal whiplash is good that's the yeah, message of the yeah, podcast exactly. it's very 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 good <laughs> do this kids you know <laughs> make sure there's more naked women one <laughs> giant guy two giant guys sorry in the movie um but the 
the, the, the like I just find how they selected the different pieces that they wanted to make. It just seemed to be for the sheer fun of it. You know, there didn't seem to be. There's no thematic through line at all. I don't even no. think they thought about a theme throughout the film. It's just science fiction. You know? No, I mean, I, I guess again talking about the sort of improvisational nature of it, they. I, I would suggest they sutured in their theme, which is like the lock, like he, people are evil. The Loch Nair makes people evil, so, so, something like they, they at least like fudged a little something in there to try to, but I think from a, like a origin, like conception standpoint, I think you're 100% correct that they're just like, we're picking what we think are the coolest stories that we can get the rights for. And we're just going to, it'll all work out in the end. We'll, we'll, we'll put them together and, and figure it out it is when i go back and reread the magazines it's all it's fun to see which ones they picked you know but there's also there's so many that i wish they'd had the chance to go back and and do too like it's i mean felipe Droulet is such a big part of the magazine and it, i've always thought it was a shame that none, none of his made it into the film don't you think that that Droulet stuff we've talked about this obviously but like it's almost unanimatable like i don't know i mean you could maybe figure out some way to do where like the backgrounds are the the of his scale and the animation is a little bit more like the dead animation or something, but um, I could understand. And also all the ones he wrote are so narratively bananas. Like, I don't even know how not, you not would... a problem here. No, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like, if I, if I could swap out Stern for, I don't know, Erm the mad or whatever, yeah, I would do yeah. it. I would do it in a minute. Yeah. Fair enough. But, what did, yeah. what did you think of Stern then? Because we haven't really talked about that one too much. I, I found it on this watch. I found it a little tedious. I always like the part in the courtroom where, you know, the, the hanging's too good for him part. I always, I think that's funny, but it, there's, there's not a lot to it. And I think the chase sequence is really boring, it, which is it. I just think it loses momentum really fast, which another cut scene when I watched the animatics is that was twice as long in oh, the wow. original cut. So, uh, you know, I think they could have, a lot less chasing get to the joke and move on because it's mm -hmm. it's not the first half is funny it, you know I, I like all those actors i'm always partial to a story that like presents a like a stereotypically looking hero and then lets you know that he's a criminal i think i think that's <laughs> sort of like the first joke in stern's that like this guy looks like the strapping hero but he's like a rapist murdering horrible person he, he even on this watch i was like oh i wonder if that brandigan is based on stern like it feels like a similar mm -hmm. joke um who knows but the but yeah and then it also has speaking of soundtrack like i that was one where i was like i don't understand why this piece of rock and roll is here and i don't understand why it's been brought in at this moment like the dialogue's still going on and suddenly there's lyrics to your rock and roll <laughs> it's just like it's really weird but i do like um like the bernie wrights and character designs a lot i mean that relates to how stern looks i think it i think i like those character designs a lot and i just like that sort of cartoonish look but i don't know i, I think it's fine the whole thing on this watch to me went down real easy like I, i've definitely watched the movie sometimes in the past and been like no but then this time i was definitely like yes Every, everything <laughs> yes yeah it's i will tell you this it's real awkward watching heavy metal with specifically a woman who hasn't seen it before so mm. we when we were making spider night <laughs> when we were shooting the stuff with Faye, the the female librarian uh, scholar we one afternoon after what after shooting we we're like, oh, well, let's all come over to my house and we'll watch heavy metal. And, you know, it was like a bunch of dudes and and Betty who played who played face. They so were like, yeah, we're going to watch heavy metal. And I just remember like feeling her discomfort with it just, like, as, as, we were, as we were watching it. I was like, oh, uh -oh. right. Because yeah. if, you, if you're not aware of all what this is and then suddenly it's like, you know, just like female nudity everywhere and like. You know, it's just it's a weird it's a weird movie, especially if you're not prepared for what you're what you're entering. I mean, she she was fine, and then a couple of years later, she was at a bar somewhere in Los Angeles mm. and sent me a text message with a photo of heavy metal playing in the bar, and she was like, "Thanks to you, I know what this is." So it <laughs> it turned turned out okay, but at the time, I was definitely like, mm, "This is yeah, uh -oh. this is uncomfortable." Yeah. <laughs> right before COVID hit up here, they were showing they showed heavy metal at the theater as part of like their you know, old movie night 
uh, so it was, that was the first time I'd seen it in the theater. I missed the re-release in the mid nineties, but, um, you could tell that a lot of people about my age had brought their wives to be like, Oh, I loved this movie when I was a kid and they're all excited. Yeah. And like, it became a lot of nervous, like, Oh no, <laughs> like, what? like you could feel the room be like, Oh no, I haven't seen this since I was 15. And I, I don't think I wanted to tell my spouse how much I love this because it's, I mean, it's like the, 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 the embodiment of the male gaze in yes. you know, juvenile male gaze. So, you know, Kevin Eastman, he tells the story that he took a date <laughs> to see it and she just stopped responding to him then never answered his calls again after that i mean he was like oh I, I i am sure there are women out there who love it but again it is it is especially if you don't know what you're in for i feel like it's a real shock uh <laughs> so yeah it's a very it's a very 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 uh specific film in that sense then is yes it? Yeah. yeah absolutely like yeah. for something that's so wide-ranging and influential that's something specific as well you're just like this is such a bizarre film like how did this happen and you know and how is it still going i'm surprised it hasn't been picked up to be like tossed into the bin of never to watch again you know <laughs> of, of of cancel culture right now <laughs> you know? I, mean, I think it's like it's just playful enough and self-aware of its own dumb teen horniness that you're it's because it doesn't feel predatory in the yes. way that like yeah i don't know porkies or a lot of the sex mm -hmm. comedies of that era do you know that there it's like except maybe so beautiful so dangerous where she just gets they they kidnap her and then lie to her that she can't about not how she can't go home uh that one but like i mean i think it's if if you were willing to uh you know give it that i i think it's so especially Dan, it's very knowingly, dumbly mm, yeah. sexual. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it's a good way to frame that idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You saved us there. <laughs> what else have you got written there, Morgan? I, I, yeah, I'm right right so, oh, super curious. Right. What else so. we got? Okay, we got Stern. We talked about Dan, Harry Canyon. I think, I mean, we don't need to get into the choices they made in adapting Harry Canyon from a much more like sort of sci fi Asian led story uh in the original one in you can if you want there's no well i don't have a ton to say about it except i think it's an interesting adaptation choice that when they took the well, the long tomorrow story to make it into a like a new york noir um it, it it's it's cool and i love uh phil and i've been talking about this in, in talking about another project we've sort of been throwing around but the like the sort of future as if bad old New York was going to be the future everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so like the technology changes, but New York just keeps getting grimier and, and more, you know, you can, I think the, the, when they go to the police station there, it feels a lot like, I don't know, where like RoboCop is heading. Like it's very much in like the, the, the zeitgeist. Yeah. So I just think that's an interesting mm -hmm. choice in Harry Canyon mm -hmm. uh, to, to deviate from it. I did when I watched the rough cut, uh, I wrote that the, the chapters are in a different sequence because they had they must have reshuffled them all and they took out the Neverwhere Land one. Hmm. So it, it starts the same. It goes soft landing, Den, and then Stern. But then it would have been the origin sequence, then B-17, so beautiful, the, the Coke aliens, then Harry Canyon and Tarna back to back at the end. Oh, wow. Which, I, which is an, it, it's interesting, too, because those are like the two ones that obviously are made to look like Mobius. And, and I even, it, every, watching it, but I always think this every time, the the part with the, the, the triple construction, triple mouthed construction vehicle that's digging yep. up the Loch Nahr, yeah. uh, it looks like it's reusing assets from Tarna even, like mm -hmm. some of the backgrounds, are, like it's very similar. Like mm -hmm. it looks like it came from that. And uh, so I, I, it's, it's an interest, you know, cause you're sort of like, do you bookend the film with the two big fantasy ones, Den and Tarna, or but then they they in the original sequence and end up with like the Mobius ones right next to each other? Just like in because each one, the transition is like zooming in and out of the Loch Nahr, you sort of get you can resequence them mm -hmm. in order. So it's like as a yeah. creative decision, like how do you put these in the film and then ultimately have to change them between 
you know, animatic and release. How then, and maybe Phil, you probably more experienced at this, like how do you sequence then anthology? You know what I mean? Like yeah. what's, the, what's the sequence of that in a sense of, I think it works so well to have the Harry Canyon so early and the Tarna so like right at the end, because I really feel like they're two of the strongest visual pieces to kind of really bring people in and then you're down in the rest of the yep. stuff and then you come back up for air at the end, you know, with that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's fascinating. That's a really good point as to like, how did they choose the sequence of this? You know, I mean, I have no idea how they made it, but I feel like they probably, in, I, I feel like it's the correct order, the order they ended in because of exactly mm -hmm. what you just said, like, yeah. like Ben is, Ben is fine, but I don't think it's as consistently strong as Harry Canyon. So doing Harry Canyon first to try to like get the audience all in before you, you know, showcase stuff that's maybe not, and you wouldn't, and I mean, B-17 is the other one that's, I think at, as consistently strong as it can be, but you wouldn't want to lead with B-17 because it's smaller and it's, you know, not, you know, just it's like just a different flavor. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think they probably made the right choice. I can't, I can't given the pieces there, imagine mm -hmm. a better order. And I think it would be weird to go, yeah, like two, like two Mobius back to back, and two like really fully fleshed out sort of narratives back to back. Also feels weird given the other pieces that you have in the middle. So I don't know. That feels like they made the right choice to me. It would almost feel as if you know they're just one, two of the same story. Then you know because yeah. they're so visually similar, and that's part yeah. of the strength of it of the like change in visuals is like you know okay we're we're moving on you know we've moved on we're somewhere else. Um, whereas if you'd kind of put those two back to back. Like, even when I first watched it, I felt the connection between those two, even though they're not connected really, but it's the visual connection. I was just like, yeah. oh, okay, this is interesting. Are we returning then back to the world of Harry Canyon or, oh, no, we're not. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's <laughs> fine, yeah. Um, and I, like, you couldn't end with something like B-17 either because that would be such a bummer, you know, you just, even though it's so strong, you'd just be like walking out of the theater with the Devo song playing after that, you'd, you'd be like, what the hell is going on? You know? would, would not yeah. be the right way to do it. Yeah. Like I, you definitely have to end with Tarna. I think you have to end. I think that's the one sort of dramatic thing that's, you know, I think probably should be consistent through anthologies. Like you want to end with your most dramatic, you want to end with your stunner. So you walk out thinking, yeah, <laughs> you know, working in a coal mine, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I think we ran into that with the Spine of Night, too, is that, you know, there's a risk of ex burnout of like, oh, and here's another story. And it's the longest one is, uh, you know, like in the same sense of like if you're putting a sequence together, like a, an album or a, a mix or something like it, it, like if you have the 11 minute track, you want to that's big and gets weird. You want to put it at the end most of the time. But, you know, I so said when we were editing ours, like we had a lot more that we'd shot of the live action reference around the, the final chapter. And it was a, like getting the rhythm so you weren't burned out on going to a new area and get, meeting new people again. Is, yeah, like it needs, it needs to feel like a climax to all the pieces as well as a piece that stood on its own. And the way that, at least in ours originally, it was like, oh, there's too much exposition here for this late in the movie. So we just need to like, it just needs to feel like the climax to the whole thing, you know? So it's as simple as you can make it, which is very much how Tarna functions. Like there's not a ton of exposition in there. Yeah, it just, yeah, there's not much at all, actually. There really isn't any apart from the council. Like, yeah, yeah. they come and serve us, you know? It's just like, <laughs> well, maybe we should think about another thing. No, no, it's, don't worry, they'll save us. I love that they're like, to summon Tarna, they just like four dudes who just like close their eyes and say like, like it's, it's very unmagical magic like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even thinking about it like the the lack of exposition like they don't need to explain anything it's just a man falls into an acid pool and then he comes out as a bad boy and starts <laughs> killing people you know and you're just like all right i get it i totally get it He's, he has to be stopped who will stop him oh okay um and that's it like there's no and they try a bit of exposition at the end like you're saying you know the new tarna has been born and long live tarna or whatever you're just like okay wait, whatever wait i want to so i want to ask about that ending uh so i have two thoughts one is to my point about how the weird astronaut daddy brought home this thing. Like 
So like one thought I had was like trying to make sense of the whole thing. It's like, oh, maybe the Lochnar like chose that astronaut because it knew it needed a new Tarna, and that's why it didn't kill him when he saw it before. But then I don't know why it would have killed him that time. Anyway, I was trying to like make that really make sense. But my real question is, <laughs> if it hadn't turned her into a new Tarna, I don't know. I don't know if there's any other way to end that story, right? Like how how else could it have ended? Like you can't just end with the house blowing up. Like you need to. <laughs> You need, I forgot you need something, that it's right? Exploded, yeah. God, <laughs> I forgot I mean, about you, that. You probably would have had to write the framing story in a way mm. where it had its own story rather yeah, than yeah. just being a window. My second question is: Do you think because when the house explodes, it's not animated; it's like a it's a model blowing up? Mm. Do you think that's because they ran out of money and they they didn't want to animate an explosion, and so they just they built the model and blew it up? It must that, be right. That is what Wikipedia says. So <laughs> I, I I think so. Yeah. Yes, I think like they. That you can tell going from the animatics to the final two, like they clearly ran out of money for a mm-hmm. lot of shots, and they and yeah. kind of just were like, well, because they'll use directly use some of the animatic art and just be like, it's fine, or they like, like some characters in Den who are just frozen until like until they have to move, not in the normal way that that happens with background characters, where it's like where they're clearly just trying to take these animatics and get the bare minimum to get them screen worthy mm-hmm. right. you know i'm sure that i'm sure the deadlines were insane yeah no it, uh, that's 100 percent what they uh, i watched a thing called reimagining or um, reimagining heavy metal where they directly said we ran out of money <laughs> <laughs> so we couldn't afford to rotoscope over this explosion so we just <laughs> left it in but it, you, you know you can see definitely the the ends uh, certain, certainly the ends of things like the end of b17 is one of the weakest shots of the film this is like it's panning out and you see these like three frame looped monsters yep. going toward him slowly <laughs> yep. and you're just like what the hell is going on everything else is so beautiful like the you know the turnaround of the the airplane as they're kind of moving the camera through space you're like wow and then at the end this is this <laughs> gray blobs kind of twitching toward a man <laughs> the scariest gray blobs that you'll ever see though. <laughs> exactly yeah it just again it's just not just total whiplash but you know visual whiplash yeah 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 definitely yeah. i feel like we've pretty much covered most of it i have a few things to think about how many like in retrospect how many amazing people worked on it like it is just i mean like it's all like because you know, the Spider Night was very self contained. When, you know, we, we wrote it together, it's all our own stuff, it was all new. But, like, to be able to draw from the comics, which has, I think, a generation defining paint stable of the, the best artists you had out and working, to then be able to pick from that, to then bring it into this where you have some of the best comedic actors of a generation mm-hmm. all chipping in. And then, you know, all sorts of you know, animation and comic luminaries who'd gone to do things. I saw, I didn't even realize Neil Adams had worked on this, who just died. So, last yeah, I, I saw his name in the credits too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and they said Mike Plug, and like, yeah. it's just, it's brimming over with just, I mean, in a way, it almost feels like the summation of just a huge part of like, I don't know, genre royalty mm. that, uh, mm. I mean, it's just, you just don't see that kind of, collaboration in the same sense anymore like it, like it, i don't even know if it would be possible to get so many disparate you know geniuses all t- together in the same place for for one year to make the craziest thing they possibly could <laughs> i mean i've seen it um i've seen it in 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 kind of a sense of old masters being pulled together and this um there's this animated film called Winter Days or Winter Nights. I think it's an anime and it has people like, you know, Isao Takata from Ghibli working on it. And, you know, it has, um, I've totally blanked on his name, but he made, you know, the, the man who planted trees and people like, uh, uh, Yuri Norstein, all these like great old masters who've been pulled together, but again, nobody knows about that. <laughs> it's right, just yeah. like it's just like oh, it's a you know, there's not it didn't in terms of success. Like I think heavy metal is probably one of the biggest in success. You know, uh, not just box office wise, but in notoriety. Like everybody has heard about this film at some yeah. stage. You know, the royalty that's emerged from it. It kind of reminds me of um, you know something like Ralph Bakshi's Mighty Mouse. So like the amount of people that worked on that, that went on to, devo- to define the next 
era of animation across the industry is just massive like there's so many people who ended up working in disney then and you know a lot of the guys went on to work in the simpsons this kind of stuff you you it's just the, the scale is huge um and i don't know i guess we won't know <laughs> until you know 10 or 20 years later we see all the big names are like oh they all worked on this you know animated <laughs> yeah. show or something you know we might we may not know but it's different in the sense where you're right like these were big at the time you know they yeah. were big names then um i guess now that would be the big marketing campaign behind the film wouldn't it i would definitely lean on that instead of the soundtrack personally <laughs> <laughs> which which seems to be how it was marketed <laughs> Uh, that's me yeah music is the voice of the teenagers though you know that's uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah that's teenagers is really d getting deep into some stevie nicks middle-aged <laughs> you know b-sides yeah and the uh, end of era blue oyster cult you know <laughs> <laughs> that's just what they wanted <laughs> if if your listeners haven't seen heavy metal i'm assuming most of them have but if you yeah, haven't they should it. go they should yeah. go see it yeah any way you can i know yeah. now it has been re-released just recently on 4k yeah. um with heavy metal 2000 which we didn't talk about at all I, um, i've never i've never seen it I, i've never finished it i've tried <laughs> a couple of times i i i think it just stinks i really oh, wish wow. it was not the case but it 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 is like of all the things you could have done as a sequel it just uh I don't know. It, it totally misses the mark for me. I don't like the music. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like the single story. It doesn't even look like the Bisley art that I do like that the story is based on. I don't know. I, I, I think it's been rightfully forgotten. <laughs> well, that comes on the release of the 4K, apparently. <laughs> well, obviously, you go get the 4K. It's a fine bonus feature. On yeah. your on your heavy metal 1981 4K purchase, and then obviously uh, something I didn't know, but when I was researching this, that Love, Dead and Robots is like a direct result of yep. you know heavy heavy metal three, basically. Yeah, one hundred percent it is. Yeah, which yeah. Is In fact, was even pitched as such originally, and then they they you know very quickly debranded it from heavy metal, and and just decided to do you know, the stories that we ended up doing, which have nothing to do with heavy metal. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just anthology, which worked. I mean, it's a, you know, it's had incredible success. They're incredible stories and a great show, you know? Yeah. Um, so good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, <thanks. laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yes, uh, whoever I will say as well, if you guys haven't seen Spine of Night, don't watch it for another 16 years. Because uh, that's <laughs> what they want. <laughs> Deprive yourself so that it acquires yeah. a massive emotional psychological weight for you and then yeah. and then and then see it yeah, yeah and then see it yeah i don't know how long that takes in this day and age a couple of days or something but yeah exactly i might just take an afternoon you know yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah. um but definitely check them both out as far as i know they're both now on 4k so you can purchase both of those yep. films um and give the money directly to the boys um <laughs> yeah but anyways thank you so much for joining me guys i really appreciated that and um, oh. it was so much fun to talk about heavy metal you know so much Indeed. fun thank yeah. you so much for having us this was a blast cool yeah thank, thank you so much